Amen. Listen, I want to welcome you to Citywide Mosaic. Uh, welcome home. Um, if you're new around here, our, our desire, our, our hope, our dream, everything that we do really is to try to ensure that you feel right at home when you're here at Citywide Mosaic. And we do that because Jesus came for all of us. He came for all of us, and he welcomes all of us into his arms. And we want to do that same thing right here at Citywide Mosaic. So welcome home. Welcome home. I want to give a quick recap of our missions trip that we had um, uh, last week. And if you were here on that mission, uh, if you were part of the 22 that went on that mission trip, and I know that's somewhere in kids and, and other places, but if you were here, would you just stand real quick? I want to just honor you real quick for going and ministering to those kids. Put your hands together for them. We had a fantastic time. Um, we were able to, um, the week, you can go ahead and take your seat. Be, the, the week before we went on this missions trip, we had been showing these pictures of these kids that we have been wanting to bless for, for many months now. And there was one particular kid, you're seeing him on the screen. At, that week before we left, I said, I'm going to find this kid. I'm going to squeeze his, his, his cheeks. I'm going to pinch his cheeks. And I'm going to tell him that we love him. And we did find him. Uh, his name is Ganai. Um, I, I uh, that's what I was told his name was, uh, um, and um, I found him, or we found him, or somebody else actually spotted him from our group and said, Pastor, um, there's, uh, Dominic spotted him and said, Pastor, there's the kid with the cheeks. You got to go pinch his cheeks, and I saw him, and he was eating, and he didn't look like he was going to have it, um, so I didn't pinch his cheeks. Um, his mom was sitting next to him as well, and his mom didn't look like she was going to have it either, and um, none of y'all wanted your pastor to get in trouble, right? So I, I kept my hands to myself. Um, but uh, I just want to tell you, I was just so blessed. I know that, that as I looked out um, into the 22 of us that were there, and we were blessing these, these kids that were there and these families that were there, I could tell that it was a life-changing experience for certain people in our group. Um, it was, it was uh, a revelation for them. It was eye-opening for many of them. Um, and not just the ability to have such a large impact, on a people that live so far away, but an impact on themselves as well. The realization that God gives us and provides so much for us. We're so blessed to be able to live in this nation. We're so blessed with everything that we have. Even in moments where we don't feel like we have a whole lot, we are still so, so very blessed right here in this incredible nation, the United States of America, where the Lord has blessed us to be. Amen? Amen. I was able to, my, my wife and I, Judy, and I were able to speak to the pastors, that pastor, that, that beautiful congregation there in Baja, California, and we were able to speak to Pastor Andy and, and Vani, or, or their names, and um, we shared with them that um, you had collected the funds to be able to bless those children and feed those children on a, on a weekly basis for an entire year, and they were just so moved by that. They're, they were just so blessed by your generosity, um, and um, I got to tell you, they're an incredible couple. Um, they're scrappy. They make things happen. You know, uh, to, to, to stand up on your own and say, we're going to feed these kids without having the finances, without having the funds, without even having, by the way, when they started this, without even having real tables, without having a real place to cook. Even now, when you go in there, the kitchen, it has a dirt floor. The stove was sitting on some cinder blocks, right? Who was cooking? The stove was sitting up on top of some cinder blocks. And they're scrappy, but they get things done because they have been called to go and do something for their Savior. And they've said, we're going to do it no matter what. And one of the things they said to, to me and to Judy was, you are an answer to our prayers. We've been praying that somebody would step up and partner with us. And you are an answer to our prayers. And I just want to say that to you today. You're an answer to their prayers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Yeah, you can put your hands together. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for giving towards Kingdom Builders. Um, um, you, you have a whole group of people in a whole other country that just absolutely love you because of what you're doing for them. Before I jump into the message, um, I just want to reiterate what Pastor Judy was saying earlier as well about inviting, inviting, inviting. Invite somebody to come and sit with church, in church with you. Listen, you, you found the love of Jesus. We want to share that with everybody. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. A couple of weeks ago, um, we started a, a, uh, a sermon, and, and today we're going to finish it off. We're going we're to be today in part two of this message that I started entitled Influenced. Influenced. What are you influenced by? Have you been influenced? Hopefully you're not under the influence of something right now. 
what is the main influence in your life? We, we read two weeks ago out of the book of Romans. We read out of Romans chapter 8. Today we're going to be reading out of Galatians chapter 5. I'm excited to find out what the Lord is trying to do this week in our church. I was just through conversation finding out on Saturday that Apparently the youth were in Galatians in their study this week, and then last night as I came into the to the young adult service last night, the young adults um, were preaching out of Galatians as well. So I've got a feeling, I'd like to take responsibility, and I'd like to claim that we set that up, but we can't take any of the credit for that. The Lord is doing something in his church through the book of Galatians this week, and um, I want to just pray real quick that we would pay attention. Do you want to pray with me? Lord, I thank you, Jesus. Lord, I still don't know what you're doing uh, through your word this week, Lord. I, I know that there's been some faithfulness that has taken place in Kanoa as he began to preach this week out of Galatians, and in Joseph as he preached out of Galatians. And God, I just pray that our minds would be open this morning, that we would truly be able to receive whatever it is that you're trying to speak to us today. Lord, I have a sense of what I want to say. You know I have my notes, but Jesus, if you would choose to scramble that, I, I would say, go ahead. But more than that, Lord, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be in every single one of our minds. If there is anxiety, that you'd remove it. If there's confusion, that you'd remove it. We place ourselves in your hands right now, and we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, soften our hearts so that whatever we would hear you saying to us today, that it would take root that it would truly impact our lives, that our lives would be affected by it. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for this incredible church. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen, amen and amen. All right. Influenced. Influenced. The funny thing is that as people, we are highly susceptible to being influenced. Do I have any honest people in the room that would say, I have been influenced by outside sources in my life. There have been things that have come at me that have just maybe changed my mood or, or have caused me to do something, something that I would look back and I'd go, why in the world did I do that? And, and as you think back, you go, oh, it was the influence of this or it was the influence of that. As people, we are highly susceptible to being influenced. And here's the thing, all sorts of stuff will influence us. People will influence us, uh, influence us. We know that. We know that we are highly influenced by other people. You know, just hang out with someone who's super negative for an hour or two. It doesn't take long for you to pick up that, that same attitude, for you to start being negative as well. Forget spending the entire day with somebody who's negative. I mean, you walk out of that going, ah, I hate life, I hate the world, I hate everything. We're so highly influenced by people. It goes the other way as well, though, doesn't it? I mean, hang out with someone who's just happy. I mean, you could be a miserable person, and if you are, let me just advise you, go hang out with someone who's always happy. Go hang out with someone who's always happy and keep your mouth shut for a second because you don't want to mess up their mood. You don't want to influence them. Let them influence you. People influence us. Environments influence us. Go to the beach. Spend a few moments at the beach. Take your shoes off. Let that sand kind of go through your toes. Walk up to the water's edge. Let that water crash on your feet. Sit there for a, for a minute or two and listen to those waves crashing. Smell the ocean air. It's not going to be too long before you are influenced into a state of relaxation. Till you're just relaxed and you're just taking in the environment. Environments influence us. I, I don't fully understand this because it doesn't work for me, but some people like to go study in a certain environment. They, they like to go study in coffee shops. You, you walk into coffee shops and people are studying. The environment somehow creates this ability for that type of personality to be focused in that environment. I think today is National Coffee Day, is it? Nobody brought me a coffee this morning, and somehow we ran out of coffee in our coffee machine over there. The environment's messing me up right now of not having coffee. But some people like to go and study at coffee shops. It doesn't work for me. It works for other people. When I walk into an environment of a coffee shop, the only influence I have because of the smells and because of what's available is the need to drink more coffee. Uh, you walk me into a coffee shop, whether I want some coffee or not, I will be drinking some coffee. Influence. Environments will 
influence us. Smells influence us. I just mentioned that a second ago. I mean, you can be completely full. You can be completely satisfied. You walk into a movie theater. You just ate. You've got no room in your belly for nothing else. But then you smell that popcorn in the air. You smell the butter. And all of a sudden, you got just a little bit more space for some popcorn. Maybe a hot dog. Some nachos. A Coke. Cherry Coke, maybe. I don't know. Smells influence us. Environments, they influence us. They shape us. Friendships, they shape us. They influence us. You know, every parent knows that, that, that this moment happens when your kids are growing up. I mean, they don't really have a whole lot of friends when they're teeny tiny. They make acquaintances, and they're highly influenced by their parents. But as they grow, we come to this moment as parents of older children, and we go, oh, my goodness, look at their friends. And they become influenced by their friends a little bit more than we would even like at many times as they begin to hang out with different people and we go, oh, oh my goodness. Highly influenced. Highly influenced. I was highly influenced as a teenager. And I go, I, gotta, I, I, I often say I, 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 get, I got myself into a lot of trouble because of the friends that I had. And then I was thinking this week and the Holy Spirit prompted me and uh, let me know that a lot of my friends got into trouble because of the influence that they had. And I thought, well, that's a moment of honesty. And thank you, Jesus, for saving me from the mess that I was in and forgive me for influencing people in a negative way at a point in my life. We have this ability to influence each other in a positive way or in a negative way. And there are so many things that influence us in our lives. What about content? What about content? What we watch influences us. What we watch influences us. If you spend uh, a lot of time on a daily basis watching the news, <clears throat> you're going to be influenced by that news. You're going to begin to just feel like, the entire world is collapsing and everything is falling apart and you're not going to believe what's happening in the weather and you're not going to be able to imagine what's happening across this world and all of that is just so horrible and it's all so horrible right here. But I look around and I think things are great. The reality is there's so much good and I, and I know there is good because I see all of you. I see what you're doing. I see what you're accomplishing. I see how you're influencing people in a positive way. But you know what happens when you allow too much of one certain kind of content into your, into your mind? You're brainwashed by it. You're brainwashed into believing that the whole world is like that. What is the content that you're being influenced by? What are you allowing into your mind? What are the algorithms that you've triggered on your socials that are just constantly in front of you, making you think that the entire world is like that, making you maybe act or behave in certain ways. What content are you taking in? You've got to be so aware that whatever content you're bringing into your life is absolutely influencing you. If you haven't done so yet, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Galatians. Galatia was, was not just one city. <clears throat> Let me give you just a little bit of context. Galatia was not just one city. It was actually a, a region, or is a region, a, a province that contained many cities in it. Think about Temecula, Marietta, Lake Elsinore, Menifee, Wildemar. These are all cities that are contained within a province. They're contained within actually a county, Riverside County. Well, then think of Galatia or the book to the Galatians in the same way. Paul's writing to a region. He's writing to multiple cities. The, the gospel has come into these cities. There are now multiple churches across this region. There are people that have become saved. There are people that were not Jews before. The, these are what we know of today as Gentiles. They had no Jewish background, but they had given their lives to Jesus Christ. These are the Galatians. The Galatians. And Paul is writing to the Galatians. He's writing to these multiple churches. There's Lystra and Derb and Iconia, all cities that are filled with Gentiles, non-Jews that are all of a sudden being converted to Christianity. But amongst some of them, there were some Jews that had been converted to Christianity as well. And Paul finds 
that he needs to write to the churches in Galatia because there's been this teaching that has come in to the Galatians where the Jews are, or some within the Jewish community have come to them and have said, yes, you too can have Christ, but you also need to do some of the Jewish things that we do. And Paul sees that, and Paul's disturbed. Paul says, what what are you talking about? That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul has been preaching the gospel to the Galatians. Paul was one of the ones that had brought the gospel to the Galatians. And Paul's message has always been a very simple message. Paul's message has always been this. All you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. So Paul begins to write. He wants to clarify that you're no longer saved by works, which was part of the old covenant, but now you are saved by grace. All you need is Jesus. Paul wants to make it very clear that we don't have this this performance that we have to do before God. It, It is not a performative relationship. Our salvation is not dependent on how well we perform in front of our God. Instead, we can simply receive what Christ brought to us, salvation. Salvation. Chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes, So Christ has truly set us free. Oh, man. So Christ has truly set us free. I pray that the Holy Spirit will let that sink into you right now. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure, he goes on to say, that you stay free. Make sure that you stay free. Jesus has broken the chains of bondage over every one of our lives, but we need to understand that the enemy is always up to what he's always up to. He's always trying to bring you back to where Jesus found you. The enemy wants to take you back to that pit where Jesus pulled you out of. The enemy wants to take you back to that place where you were bound in chains, and he wants to put you right back into that mess. He wants to put you right back into that previous sin that you had. And Paul says, you make sure that you stay free, for Christ has truly set you free free. And in the Galatian context, he was talking about something very specific. Paul goes on and he says this, he says, and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. That was part of their bondage, slavery to the law. Verse two, listen, I, Paul, tell you this, if you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit for you. This is wild. This is wild. This is wild because as part of the law, circumcision was part of the law. And this is wild because you had these Jews that were coming to the brand new Christians and saying to them, hey, you've got to do some of these things that us Jewish people have been doing for centuries. And some of them were doing it. This is wild. I bet there's not a single person in this room today that is putting their hope of salvation on circumcision this morning. No, sir. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. But for a Jewish person, this was part of their covenant. For a Jewish person, this was a sign of their, uh, uh, and a personal reminder to them that they had this covenant with their God. I want to bring it into this context today. Even in today's world, we may look at that and we may go, that's wild that they went down that path. That's wild that Jesus had set them free. They didn't have to do these things anymore. But yet somehow they got right back into this path where they figured or they thought that they had to perform as well in order to be saved. I wonder if you could think of some things in the church today where we go, oh, we must do this or we must do that. I don't think we have a lot of that in this church. But when I look at the church as a whole, sometimes I see people striving for their salvation, working hard for their salvation. And I think that Paul wants to remind us today, you, my friend, have already been set free. Christ has already paid the price for your salvation. He's already paid the price for your salvation. but there's people out there 
There's people out there that, that feel like they've got to do things. There's people that feel like they must perform some sort of pilgrimage. They must go to a certain place so that they can truly have their salvation. And, and listen, I'll tell you what, I'd love to go on a pilgrimage. I'd love to go on some of these walks through Spain and to go visit some of these places. But they're not tied to my salvation. Christ has set me free. He's paid the price for my salvation. But there are some that think they must. They have to. I've known people, I've spoken to people that say to me, I must pray this certain prayer 15 times a day in order for, for my salvation to be secured. I, I must go up these certain stairs in this certain city on my knees a certain amount of time so that I can secure my salvation. And Paul is trying to tell us today, hey, that was happening back then in Galatia. It didn't need to happen in Galatia. It didn't need to happen in Rome. It doesn't need to happen in Temecula. You've been set free! The price has been paid by Jesus Christ. Verse 3, he says, I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. And Paul's really just kind of teasing them because he knows they can't. Verse 4, for if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. And I don't know if he's trying to do a pun there. I don't know what's happening there. You have fallen away from God's grace, he says. Let me talk to you for the next several moments about influences that we can have. Number one, the first influence a negative influence that you would have is the influence of legality. Legality or legalism or feeling like you've got to always be following some certain law, um, even within the scriptures. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12 says, But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. That's a problem. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands. See, that's the problem. All the commands that are written in God's book of the law. This is the very reason why Jesus Christ knew he had to come and purchase salvation for us. He's looking down, he's saying, they can't do it. They can't do it for themselves. There's no way that they can follow all the laws. So Christ stepped out of heaven to come and set us free from it, to come and pay the ultimate price for all of our sins. Verse 11, so it's clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it's through faith that a righteous person has life. Verse 12, this way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. Paul has a dilemma. Here's Paul's dilemma. Paul had brought the simple gospel of Jesus saves to the folks in Galatia, to, to, to these people that needed to hear the gospel message, to these people that needed to be saved. And someone's come in and someone is teaching to them that it's not only through Jesus, that Jesus is not enough. My friends, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus paid the price. He paid the full price. Jesus is enough. If someone comes preaching to them, telling them, hey, you need to follow the law, and Paul's disturbed by this. I think he's especially disturbed by this because Paul understood the law. Paul was a product of the law. Paul grew up focused on the law. Paul came into a, a position of ministry prior to Christ because of the law. And Paul says, I was the closest follower to the law that you would ever come across. I followed all of the laws. And yet Paul understood that he still needed Jesus Christ, that he still could not attain salvation without Christ. And Paul's going, what, what are you people doing? Even I, the best follower of the law, could never achieve salvation, but only through Christ Jesus. Only through Christ Jesus. And by the way, when we're talking about the law, you might think, Pastor, are we talking about the Ten Commandments? And a lot of people know the Ten Commandments. We see that as the law, but this was beyond that. This was the Ten Commandments plus many more. So uh, as people, we get creative sometimes, and as people, we want more explanation, and as people, we want to go deeper, and as people, sometimes we, we make things harder than they need to be. And this was the condition. We've got the laws of Moses, the mitzvah, 613 laws, and we could put the, uh, the graphic up on the screen. There were 613 laws broken up into two categories that the Jewish people had to follow, known as the mitzvah. 
two categories. 365 of those laws are don't do's, or as the screen says, prohibitions. Uh, the, there's there's one don't do, if you want to try to remember this, there's one don't do for every day of the year. But that doesn't mean that you're just focused on one don't do every day. You've got 365 don't do's that you've got to be very familiar with, that you've got to understand, that you have to have memorized so that you don't accidentally break them every day of your life. Some of us would be in trouble, Seth. Because there's a law in there that says don't eat pork, and I like bacon. Amen. Carnitas. Chicharrones. Some of us would be in trouble. There's a law in there that says don't eat shrimp. <clears throat> Some of us would be in trouble. There's a law in there that says don't tattoo yourself. Don't mark yourself. That's number 41 in case you're wondering. Oh, don't look over at someone who's got a lot of tattoos. <laughs> and before you judge that person, number 68 is don't cut your sideburns, so you better start letting the mutton chops come out and bring them out. Wait, wait. Because it also says don't trim your beard. It's a hard one for the ladies. I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm just being guided by the Holy Ghost right now, Seth. Just being guided by the Holy Ghost right now. Sorry. No, you're laughing so hard. I don't. There's one in there about not cutting a fruit tree in a time of siege. I feel like we're always in a time of siege. You better not cut any fruit trees. They had these 365 don't do's that you had to have memorized, you had to know, you better make sure you're not violating. And Paul, by the way, was the policeman. Paul was constantly, it was part of his job to look out and see who was violating the laws before he came to Jesus Christ. He knew the laws. He knew the laws. He followed the laws. Poor guy, never had shrimp. <clears throat> but Jesus set him free. Maybe that's why he was so excited. 365 don't do's and they had 248 do-do's. 248 duties. That didn't make it any better. 613 laws, <laughs> Rick, Rick, control yourself over there. 613 laws that they had to follow. 613 every single day of their lives. God gave them 10 commandments. They got creative. They came up with 613 legalisms, legalities to go with those 10 commandments. And Paul's saying, you better be careful. You better be careful, because if you're getting hung up on one, you'd better be ready for the other 612 that are right behind it. You'd better be careful. You better watch out what you're doing. You don't want to be saved by the law, Paul's telling them. You need Jesus, and that is all that you need. And Paul never said, in fact, he never said we're throwing away the law. He says, actually, the laws are good. They're good for you to know them. They're, they're good practical things for you to know. In fact, they show you what sin is and what sin is not. So don't throw away the laws, but don't ever think that they're going to save you. Don't ever think that they're going to save you. Jesus saves you. It was Jesus that said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. What did verse 1 again say? So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Guys, are you counting on works to save you? If you think that going on a missions trip has got you covered? Nope. 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 Don't count on works to save you. Jesus saves you. He said it's finished. It's finished. You're saved by what he did for you on the cross. I do want to say to you this morning that if your faith has gotten complicated, if your faith has gotten complicated, if you're in a place in your life where now you're saying it's Jesus plus, it's Jesus plus this, it's Jesus plus that for me to be truly saved, if your faith has gotten complicated, I just want to ask you to go back to Jesus today. Let me encourage you, just go back to Jesus today. It's all you need, Jesus. 
So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. And Paul is so focused because I think he's hyper-focused because he's come out of this. I was having a conversation the other day with somebody, and, and they were asking me about some of the things that I do. Because I, I can tend to be <laughs> a little extreme in certain things with my own life. Uh, there are some things that I cut out of my life when I came to Christ, and I knew I needed to cut them out because I didn't want to get dragged back into them, Marty. So I had to separate myself, and there are things, and that was 30-plus years ago. There are things today that I stopped doing then that I refuse to even dabble in. And that can be seen as extreme sometimes. But hey, that's me, man. I, I know what I came out of. I know what I came out of. I know what I have to stay away from. Rick, it's like, it's like someone who, who was addicted to meth, and guess what? They, they know they've got to stay away. They know that they can't even be around the smell of it. They know that they can't be around it. They know they've got to stay out of certain neighborhoods and, and out of certain places because they know that they can so easily get drugged back in. And, and I think this is why Paul was so focused on it. He talks a lot about staying away from the law in the book of Romans. He talks a lot about being careful with the law in the book of Galatians. Paul just, he hammers down on this, I think because it was such a big deal in his life. I think because it had him chained up so tightly. And when he came to Christ, man, there's nothing like the feeling of freedom from Jesus. When you experience true freedom from Jesus, you never want to go back. You never want, you become passionate. You Love him with everything that you have. Paul says, don't get distracted with legalism. Don't get distracted with legalism. Instead, be focused on other things. Be focused on your faith in Christ Jesus and in him alone. Be focused on loving other people. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But the next influence, the negative influence that Paul tells us to stay away from, to stay away from is the influence of the flesh. Let's read verse 17, and, and uh, then we'll read 19 through 21 out of the, the same chapter, chapter 5 of Galatians. It says, For the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit, the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your own good intentions. Paul says there's two forces that are just at war inside of every single one of us, constantly fighting against each other. The, the flesh has these desires, that, and it wants to try to get you to act out on those desires. But the Spirit of God that has been deposited inside of you has desires as well, and is trying to get you to do what He wants you to do, to do those good things that He set out in front of you to do. And we're constantly... At, at, at war within ourselves. There, there's this war that's happening inside of each and every single one of us between that sinful nature or what the Bible also describes as our flesh. Always fighting against the new creation that Jesus Christ has made us to be. The point is, don't let your guard down. You can't. You can't let your guard down. You can't. I might I remind you, so many of you, Jesus picked you up out of a pit. Some of you would describe it as a pit of hell. And that flesh is like trying to get you to go right back. And that slope is slippery. Don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard, not for a second. Don't let your guard down. Understand and know you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're a new, you know, your pastor knows and understands this. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Man, I know it. I know it, but there's this war inside. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, but give me, give me a few minutes behind the wheel, stuck in traffic. And, you know, I love people. I love you. But the guy in front of me that just keeps stopping wrong, 
or this car that just keeps kind of coming over, coming too close to my lane. He's, I could see he's, he's texting. Why are you texting? <laughs> Give me a minute, man. Give me a minute. And the flesh eagerly trying to take me back to the hood. <laughs> Quickly trying to drag me back to moments of anger and hatred. It doesn't take a whole lot. There's always this constant fight inside of us. And yes, we understand that we're a new creation, but we'd better understand that there is a war happening. There's a war happening between the desires that we have, the desires that the Spirit is giving us, and the desires that the flesh will always have. Verse 19. This is why you don't want to lose to those fleshly desires. Verse 19. Paul says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. See, some people begin into witchcraft, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Paul's saying, don't think that's an all-inclusive list. And other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Deep. Highlight it. Keep it in your Bible. Paul says we have these two forces that are constantly fighting <clears throat> against each other. The question you have to ask yourself every day is, who is going to win? Who's going to win? Who's going to win the fight? Think of it this way. There are two angry dogs, two angry, mean dogs that are at war with each other. There's two angry, mean dogs that are at war with each other. I heard a story of a man who enjoyed sports betting or betting on sports. And at that time, the only sport that was available for him to bet on was dog fighting. Don't judge me for this story. I'm not promoting dog fighting. I like dogs. We like our dogs. But this was just normal during that time frame. And there would be these dog fights. And there was a promoter that had a group of dogs and he would put on these dog fights and people would come out and people would bet. <clears throat> and this man was very much into betting on these on the sport, right, of dogfighting. And he would come in, and he started noticing this. He started noticing all of a sudden that the promoter that was bringing the dogs in, that was, that was you know, putting on the show and, and, and having the dogs fight, he started noticing that the promoter was betting on the side on his own dogs. And whichever dog the promoter bet on would always win. So he goes to the next show, and he goes to the promoter, and he tells the promoter, I've noticed this. I've noticed that you're betting on your own dogs and you always win. And I don't want to turn you in, but I do want to know your secret. Tell me what your secret is. And the promoter denied the whole thing. He said, no, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. I've seen you do it. I've seen you do it. And listen, I'm willing to give you all the money that I brought in today so that you'll tell me how it is that you know which dog is going to win? The promoter said, I'll take your money. And he told him how it is that he always wins. This is what he said to him. He said, on the morning of the fight, I feed the dog that I want to win, and I starve the dog that I want to lose. In other words, I feed the dog that I want to be strong, and I starve the dog that I want to be weak. That'll preach. That'll preach. We each have these two influences inside of us that are constantly at war with each other. They're constantly fighting with each other. And the question is, guys, which one are you feeding? Which of those dogs are you feeding? Which of the influences in your life are you feeding? Whichever one you're feeding, that's the one that's going to to win. If you're feeding those fleshly desires, guess what's going to win? If you're feeding those, the, those, those godly desires, guess what? That one is going to be the one that's going to be strong and will win. If you're feeding your spirit, if you're reading your Bible, if you're worshiping constantly, if you're praying 
constantly. If you're fellowshipping with other believers constantly, and you're starving the desires of the flesh, then my friends, the Spirit will win. The Spirit will win. So which dog are you feeding? Which dog are you feeding? Paul warns us, stay away from the influence of legalism. Stay away from the influence of the flesh. And then in verse 13, he promotes something different. He says, you need the influence of love in your life. Love. Galatians 5, 13, verse, uh, 13 through 15. He says, for you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Verse 14. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. <clears throat> what is Paul saying? He says, For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, Jesus has set you free from the law. You were spending a whole lot of time chasing the law. You were spending a whole lot of time trying to make sure that you didn't violate this or you didn't violate that. Even worse, you were spending a whole lot of time making sure that those around you weren't violating the law. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of pressure. Chasing after everybody, making sure that they're behaving, making sure that they're following the law, making sure that they've got the 613 things that they're either doing or not doing and that they're doing them properly. And Paul's saying, you've been set free from that. You have freedom from that. Now that you have freedom from that, now you've got a lot of extra time on your hands. And I want you to do something else with that extra time. I want you to spend all of that extra time that you now have on your hands loving one another. Well, that's good. I can stop being critical about the people around me. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Now I can spend all of my time just loving on other people. Man. That's good. So, so good. That we don't have to spin our wheels on something that ultimately is not going to bring us to salvation anyways. We don't have to be so caught up in, in all of this legalism that so many in the world are caught up with. Before Christ, all of our energy was, was put into being made right with God, obeying all of the laws. But now that Christ has saved us, we can take all that energy and occupy ourselves with loving other people. What does that look like? Well, guess what? It does look like maybe taking a weekend of your own time and going on a mission trip and just blessing complete strangers, loving on them, bringing hope to them, maybe feeding them, bringing something tangible to them to show them that we don't just speak and say that we love them, but we actually show to them that we love them. What does it look like loving one another? It can look like calling a church member that you know is struggling with something and having a conversation with them and maybe going over and visiting them and maybe providing your shoulder for them to cry on for a few moments. What does loving other people look like? It could look like filling somebody's random need on the street or somebody's random need in a classroom or one of your coworkers filling one of their needs that you know that they have. We hear so many needs on a daily basis, people going through so many different things. Can we fill a need? Can we just love a random person? What does loving one another look like? It can look like sharing the gospel message with your neighbors, standing on a street corner after school, asking people if they need prayer, letting them know that Jesus loves them. What does loving one another look like? It can look like inviting your neighbors, inviting your friends, inviting your coworkers to come and sit with you in church. The point is, now that we have freedom in Jesus Christ, that freedom is not to be wasted pursuing the things of the flesh. But that freedom is there so that we could love one another. Why does Paul say, be careful? Towards the end of what we just read, he says, be careful that you not bite and devour one another. He says that because when you become legalistic, <clears throat> you can't help but to criticize other people around you. I've been there. I was saved at a time where we all had to wear suits and ties to church. And at first, I was the odd one out. I didn't even own a suit and tie. Reuben, 
I was like, what is happening here? I must, I guess I got to go buy one so I could fit in and, and I could be a part of what's happening here. And, and maybe there was even a little bit of confusion in my own head of thinking, maybe I'm not being a good enough Christian because I'm not dressing right. There's some legalism in that. And here's where the legalism comes. If you're just trying to look good, bless your heart. But if you're sitting there going, man, I can't believe that guy's not wearing a tie like the rest of us do. What's wrong with him? Or if you're on the opposite end, I can't believe that guy wears a, church, uh, a tie to church. What's wrong with him? Legalism. We've become critical. We've, we've, we've picked up these laws that we've just made up on our own, like guess who was doing back then? Legalism. Paul's saying, make sure that you're not backbiting each other and criticizing each other for maybe some of these little differences that you have with one another. Oh, well, everybody at that church has tattoos. I've heard that said. I've heard that said. Well, they wear dresses at that church. You don't want to go there. Or they don't wear any dresses at that church. You don't want to go there. Legalism. Paul says you be careful that you not start to criticize and backbite your brothers and sisters in Christ. There may be some differences between this church here and the one down the street on the corner, but you just better be careful because you don't need that type of influence in your life. That's called legalism. What you need is love. Love for one another. And I want you to know, to know today that a Citywide Mosaic, we don't care what you look like. We're going to love you anyways. We're going to love you anyways. First and foremost, we will love. At the end of the day, we're not going to stand in judgment on how perfect we keep the law, but we will stand in judgment on how well we love each other. The next influence that Paul urges us to allow in our lives is the influence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the influence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 through 25, this is what it says. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the Holy Spirit be the main influence in your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you're, you're, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passion and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Verse 25, since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. When you follow the Spirit, You don't do what your sinful nature desires. When you're following the Spirit, you, you, you stop. You go the other way. Your, your sinful nature is always going to be there. There's always going to be this fight, but you stop and you go, hold on. Not what my flesh wants. Not the sinful desires. But what the Spirit wants. I'll do what the Spirit wants. And if you're struggling with some sort of immorality, if you're giving into your sinful desires, I just want to encourage you today. Would you stand with me for just a few moments and close your eyes, bow your heads for just a few moments. If you've been giving into your sinful desires, I just want to encourage you today. Number one, number one, there's no shame here in this place. Jeez, that would be real legalistic of me, right? If I looked at you and said, I can't believe you're doing that or that other thing. There's no shame in this place. If you've been struggling with your sinful desires, I just want to encourage you. Listen, read your Bible more. Pray every day, pray often. Pray without stopping and ceasing the Bible sense. Get the influences out of your life that are dragging you back into that garbage. Maybe the bad friendships and set those aside for a minute and hang out with your brothers and sisters right here at church. 
get around around the right influences and let the Holy Spirit then be strengthened in your life. Holy Spirit, in this moment, we ask that you would strengthen us. That you would strengthen us. Father God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, sir, we place our lives in your hands. We're, we trust you with our lives. We put all of who we are in your hands. And in this moment, I just ask that you would strengthen every single person in this body today. That we would live just the way you want us to live. That we would win every fight that comes against us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Be the main influence in our lives. And, and if there's someone here who has yet to be baptized by you, we ask that you bring that baptism over them right now in the name of Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you this morning. Yeah, and if you want to just stay in this place and just worship for a bit, you're welcome. But if you have places to go, you're free to leave. And yeah, if this is